Yeah, thanks everyone for coming. So I will be presenting a study I did of a tech company who provides AI analytics about farmland around the world. Uh, the title here alludes to Shakespeare's uh, If Music Be the Food of Love. My appeal is for you all to consider cloud infrastructure as a staple feeding modern AI and creating the kind of uh, persistent instability that Aaron was just talking about. I studied in the context of workers trying to develop an AI in this environment of instability. Uh, so here's the plan. We'll start by recognizing that the cloud is becoming very critical to modern digital services, including AI services that must operate at scale. Um, what I mean by the cloud is, you know, the distributed computational resources that's made available through the internet from a virtually unlimited number of providers. So if you think of, um, you know, when you use Google Drive to share documents, technologies like that. Um, so then we'll get to my field site where AI is used to analyze aerial imagery overlooking farm fields across the world. Uh, you'll see me mention clouds at that point, both digital and atmospheric, and the pun is intentional. Um, what I find is that in such cloudy conditions of work, you know, the work to make the AI work is seemingly indefinite. And I'll, I'll tell you what I mean by that later. Uh, but in that way, it's a, it's a kind of opacity that is not black box in nature, a different kind of opacity where they don't know what's coming, this, this instability that Aaron talked about. Um, by the end, hopefully you'll be persuaded that the cloud is critical to many AI operations and that AI work is not located in a singular organization or even a single entity, even if nominally it seems that way. So um, live cloud-based digital services, a, a common example and one that's relevant to my setting is uh, Google Maps. If you guys use Google Maps, you know, you download the app or you use it online and it, it updates with live information as you're using it. So you don't have to keep installing new things to get new content. Um, so many organizations have taken this route, you know, Netflix and Spotify and, and many digital services that have shifted from discrete deliverables to ongoing live digital services. And what's unique about them is that they can continue to learn uh, using AI jargon, you know, continue to learn and improve in use while users have the product. Um, one meme that I came across that I quite like is this one about Tesla, that a new Tesla doesn't come with the new car smell, it comes with Elon Musk. Um, and, and it really, I think, conveys well the idea that when you're using a service, the developers are there with the product in your hand and they can, they can keep tinkering with it while you're using it. Um, so AI is generally more effective the more varied data it can learn from and the more algorithms that can inform it and the more computers that uh, it can run on. So scale is in many cases imperative to AI. Um, the distribution speed of content is generally not a problem through the internet, you know, it's quite immediate, but development times can be quite slow if you're developing new content. So rather than develop everything themselves, companies leverage components already made and maintained by, uh, by others. And it's through the cloud that the work of numerous unrelated actors can end up constituting an AI service that at least nominally seems like a singular entity. So let me show you what this looks like at Digital Ag, the company that I studied for over a year and a half. My access was perhaps unique. And Gila talked about the difficulty of studying companies actively developing AI. Um, I think because I'm a student, it, it gave me some opportunities to play dumb. And so they let me in. I got access. So I got single sign on access to all the internal wikis, their Slack channels, um, their databases and code bases. Uh, I was also given badge access to, to sit in on all the data science meetings and engineering meetings. So I really got uh, a good look at you know, the cloud and how many of the interactions that the workers in the company had were actually with components from outside the company. Um, and it really you know, touches on what scholars of AI have talked about the distributedness problem that the AI tends to be distributed among many organizations. So the, what the company provided, the heart of the company was geospatial services. So they, they attempted to build AI that could map the world's food supply and then generate analytics about that food supply. So some things they could do 
you know, with mapping out food supplies, mapping out where all the crops are grown, what kind of crops are grown, when they're planted, what chemicals are used, how much they're being irrigated, uh, who's who's farming what, what are the sizes of the farms? I mean, all this information you can kind of see from aerial imagery like satellites and drones. Uh, and so the company could then create AI, pro uh, AI services that, for instance, recommended products to farmers in certain conditions. Maybe you want to apply this kind of chemical or maybe you should buy this kind of thing. They could also forecast yields for, for traders of commodities who want to know the fluctuations of certain crop uh, harvests year after year. They could also rate growers for various buyers, like um, you can think Kellogg's or Nestle, who, who want to source from reliable growers. They, you can tell from aerial imagery what kind of practices they do on the farm. Um, and so they also could render boundaries, which is important for governments who want to know where the farmers are and how big their parcel sizes are and if they're paying taxes on time. Um, you can also predict locations of where things will be planted or where current plantings will go fallow based on uh, aerial imagery. And again, identifying practices. Right now, there's a big focus in agriculture for regenerative farming, meaning you know certain tillage practices, certain crop rotation practices. You can see all that from, well, roughly from, from the sky. And so they have many users of this service, growers, buyers, suppliers, traders, insurers, regulators. I mean, it's a big, big audience. It's very ambitious of the company to try to do. So here's kind of sampling of what the products look like to the end users. They start with maps and then with the maps, they generate these analytics and various reports that update daily because weather is constantly changing. You know, farmers are planting different things at different times of the year. And depending on the weather, they might pull out or change their plans, uh, you know, last minute. So the main takeaway here is that workers at Digital Ag feed their AI with all sorts of data and algorithms from the cloud that they, they have data from satellites, drones, tractors, ground sensors, human scouts, uh, and many of which almost exclusively they do not own or have any control over. Uh, and algorithms whose code is developed and maintained by other companies and by open source communities. So they don't own any satellites even though their um, AI is heavily dependent on satellite imagery. So it is through the cloud that Digital Ag is able to plug in their AI into all of these different components from all these different providers satellite agencies from governments all around the world because their, their ambition is to map the whole world's food supply. So you can imagine how complicated it gets. I'll give you an example of an application of their AI. Um, so farmers generally operate with great autonomy, uh, especially in developing countries. The, they're, they're kind of just doing their own thing. There's no central repository of where all these farms are and what they're doing on their farms. So it's very difficult for this company and the workers at this company to figure out where the farms even are. So with satellite imagery, they're trying to create AI to detect where the boundaries are of the farm. Here's an example of the difficulty. So in the agricultural world, big problem is getting the delineation and field boundary right. And so we get that from the planter, you know, the grower, who's driving on the field and getting data from there. And then there's the growers who say, I bought this field and this is the delineation from the government. I paid that much for that many acres. And then you have the harvester who gives you another boundary based on what it drove. Uh, if you have John Deere harvester, your data goes through their platform, which has a different format than if you use a different brand of harvester. So you can see the, the complication here where even to figure out where the farmland is, uh, the source of truth is really hard to pin down as the data scientist says. And so what I mean by the cloudy conditions, it, once I began studying the, the teams, it became clear that uh, AI behaved in a certain way where it was, it was really working in parts and, and many times it only apparently worked. It looked good. You saw the maps and you saw the analytics, the numbers were, were computing, but they weren't actually reflecting things properly because some parts that were interconnected were not properly integrated. Uh, and, and you get this problem where it's only working maybe for now and then in a few days it doesn't work anymore because someone changed something. Um, these masks, the, so the crops are changing over time, and they're different for different countries and for different crops. And one engineer said, there's a lots more geographic calibration necessary than originally thought. So it's difficult to interpret and follow. And the opacity um, comes in because these things are changing so much and you don't know how they're changing. So although you might see 
exactly what the components are doing, you don't know what they will do. So there's a capacity into, I guess, the future, the near future. Um, and this creates a interesting conditions for the workers, which is uh, it's, it's often incomplete, it's indefinite, and they do not know what's coming next because they don't own or control many of the components that are feeding their service through the cloud. So they have in their user-facing services this uh, disclaimer, these materials are subject to change and include information obtained from sources believed to be reliable, but we do not warrant their completeness or accuracy. So they're they're trying to go after you know these indefinite ends, trying to make everything more accurate, you know, to include more countries, to include more crops. And the engineer told me that they have all these data sources that they need to get, but they can't. You know, it takes so long to integrate each one and tend to to maintain them every day. So uh, the cloud enables the digital ags AI services to remain incomplete, perpetually changing, uh, but but also usable. Uh, and so what I want to leave you guys all with is to consider, one, the role of cloud infrastructure in creating this very dynamic, and, and as Aaron said, um, persistently unstable environments for work, but also to kind of raise the profile on agriculture. I think most people here who study AI study in professional settings, and I think uh, agriculture is a often missed, but shouldn't be because more than uh, half, I think the majority of all the world's income comes through farming. Um, and because it is often not seen in the media and not heavily regulated, you can see a lot of companies creating these impromptu um, arrangements to map things because no one's really looking to regulate them. Thank you.